Uh, my name's Michael Johnson. I'm a plastic surgeon, reconstructive surgeon, cosmetic surgeon, hand surgeon, jack of all trades. Um, but I, uh, my main role in academics and with Wright State is I'm the professor and chief of plastic surgery uh, with the division of Wright State Plastics. Now, most of the time you guys come to these things and we're talking about orthopedics and bone breaking and knee replacements and shoulder surgery and all that other stuff. It's kind of a long convoluted story how plastics and reconstructive and orthopedics came together into, into one division, which I won't bore you guys with the details, but suffice it to say we're all together and uh, we all work pretty well uh, with the orthopedic surgeons um, in our group. So um, that having been said, it was brought up uh, as part of these educational conferences through our orthopedic division or department for us to uh, uh, kind of give you guys some ideas about things with, sun, with uh, summer coming up, some ways to protect your skin, and some other things that we might be able to do to uh, improve your skin. And so that's why I'm here tonight. Um, I don't have very many, I purposefully made this slide presentation very short. Um, and so what I want to do is have, leave plenty of time for questions and answers and those kind of things because I really, this is all about kind of giving you guys some information more than it is about me kind of doing stuff um, to, that may, not, may or may not be interesting. So if I get off on a tangent, uh, just let me know. Um, how many of you guys have heard this um, quote before? Wear sunscreen. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great article. It was written by Mary Simonship in the Chicago Tribune in 1997. I, uh, I think it's very, very classic and uh, an excellent um, way to start the presentation because it talks about sunscreen and life. And um, it was initially thought that this was written by Kurt Vonnegut and got kind of an urban legend was that this was a graduation speech, but it really wasn't. It was written by a lady at the, in the Chicago Tribune. I recommend you look it up if you haven't had a chance to. Um, <clears throat> so what is uh, sun damage and how does it occur? So basically we're talking about ultraviolet rays that come from the sun, originating from the sun. And uh, it's a form of actual radiation, uh, radiation being being a, a powerful force that sometimes is used to treat cancer. And these are just waves of energy that come from the sun and then they interact with the skin. And this interaction leads to structural conformational changes and biologic changes that occur in the skin. And this can lead to uh, skin cancer and premature aging, precancerous lesions, all kinds of different, uh, different things. So I call it ultraviolet radiation, but it's actually ultraviolet radiation. It's, um, you have uh, UVA and UVB. Um, UVB radiation is radiation that really works on the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, um, and doesn't penetrate very deep. Um, UVA radiation is the one that's more serious. And it was only recently that they started developing sunscreens that actually work for UVA. So UVA uh, sunscreens, um, the, the SPF that we'll talk about or the sun protection factor that you see in radiation or in uh, sunscreens actually only accounts for the UVB um, type of, uh, in terms of the scale. Um, so there are, most sunscreens now do have UVA protection, but it has nothing to do with the SPF factor, which is kind of interesting. So um, the, that's still science that's in, in progress right now. But, Almost all sunscreens do have UVA and UVB protection. Um, UVC, there's also UVC, but it doesn't actually ever reach the earth to have any effect on the skin. So SPF means uh, sun protection factor. You see it on every bottle. How is it measured and how much is enough? Uh, some frequent questions that we see. So um, SPF 15 is recommended year round by dermatologists, which is kind of interesting. Uh, only, and I, as I mentioned, uh, only uh, F SPF only measures effectiveness against UVB radiation, which is less important than UVA. So a 15, SPF of 15 means that you can be in the sun 15 times longer than you could be without sunscreen and not experience burning of the skin. Now, is that actually accurate and how do they actually come up with that? It's kind of um, a little bit interesting because it really depends upon your skin type, which we'll talk a little bit about too because obviously people with very fair skin are going to be able to stay in the sun less long than an African-American person. Um, so that's kind of the way that will work. But an SPF of two, and it's not, um, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. An SPF of two blocks 50% of the UVA rays. SPF of 15 blocks 93%, and SPF of 34 only goes an extra, 90, uh, an extra 4%. 
So when you got talk about SPF 70, SPF, SPF 50, um, you probably are getting minimal benefit once you get beyond, once you get beyond the SPF of 15 or 30, something along those lines. So skin care is also a broad topic. Uh, we'll talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about some over-the-counter creams, peels, lasers, and other things that we do. But skin care basically has a lot to do with um, moisturizing. Um, and, that, and a lot of the sunscreens will do this for you also. Um, there's, uh, but that's probably the main thing is moisturizing and cleansing agents that we're talking about there. Peels are um, basically chemicals that we apply to the face facial structure that actually take the top layer of skin off and produce an inflammatory response in the dermis which helps to thicken the skin and improve the skin. And then lasers we'll talk a little bit about too. And I'll be happy to go, that's almost a whole nother hour long talk about that. But the interesting thing, in, as, as part of my job, I am a burn surgeon as well, and so we see a lot of burn patients. And it was very obvious to me early on in my career that patients that come in that have flash burns to the face actually do, if they don't require, don't, they're not severe enough where they require grafting, if you follow them for a year, two years out, they look much better than people their own age in that situation. And it's because this, uh, it's essentially peeling things off. Now we don't recommend you go out and, you know, stick your hand in a, in a gas grill and light the propane and blow it up. That's not what we're asking you to do here. But it was an observation that we find that an injury if it's not a severe injury, it's the old, if it, does, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. If it doesn't kill you, it makes it look better sort of thing. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures about how these things look. Because this is how, um, how patients look on the left here after a flash burn to the face. And on the right, this is a guy that's about a year after the surgery. You can see how smooth and shiny his skin is. Hardly a wrinkle on this guy who's uh, in his upper 40s, almost 50. So pretty amazing appearance in terms of how, how that looks. And this is not a treatment that we did or anything like this. This is just a burn patient. Sure. Fire away. I'm happy to. The epidermis. Right. Right. So the epidermis is burned away. So that's the definition of a second degree burn. So a first degree burn this is a sunburn where you get the redness of the skin but no blistering, okay? So a second degree burn is just like this where you have a superficial into the dermis layer of the skin. So you've got epidermis on top, dermis underneath that, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the skin but, but the dermis is underneath that. And that's what actually you get a burn down into the dermis. Now the way the skin regenerates from there is that there are sweat glands and hair follicles that have skin cells that then migrate up out of that and then spread across the wound. So it, it heals without scarring because it's, it, the dermis is still intact. And in fact, what happens is it thickens up. So if you look at an aging process, for instance, when you, when you look, at a, look at a young child or a young person without any wrinkles, and you look at the conformation of their, in fact, I might use this whiteboard over here. What you, what you see is, so you've got, you've got epidermis on top, and there's different layers of epidermis. You've got a basement membrane here, and then underneath that you have the dermis. And what happens is in a young person, it looks like this. There's this nice wavy reticular pattern that has elastin elements in it, which makes the skin very easy to kind of snap back into position. Okay? Now what happens as we get older, and with the damage of the radiation that we talked about, what happens is is that these nice collagen, and this is all collagen essentially, which is what we're talking about here when I draw these lines. This is all collagen, and these collagen fibers become broken and brittle, okay? And those, those are what cause the, the wrinkles. Um, it actually doesn't necessarily cause the wrinkles. The wrinkles are caused by the underlying muscle pull that of the, and that's when we talk a little bit about neuromodulators and Botox and those kind of things. But when you have a transverse line across your forehead, it's because the skin is set up because it's brittle, and then you have muscles that are raising your eyebrows. And so they, those lines always occur perpendicular to the underlying muscle. So the, these lines that occur on the face and wrinkles like that always occur perpendicular to the line of the underlying muscle. Very predictable. Did I answer your question? Yes, 
Oh, it depends on the location on the body. Like eyelids are very thin. We're talking just a, maybe a couple thousandths of a millimeter. Back skin can be up to five to seven millimeters, even more in some patients, yeah. So the burn that injury that occurs, it, take, it kind of hits this level right here, okay? And then there are sweat glands and hair follicles that are in a deeper layer of the dermis. They migrate up. So this is all gone initially. They migrate up and spread across. But in the process of that, what happens by causing an injury, it stimulates collagen production. So you get back to this normal looking activity by causing that kind of a controlled injury. Is there any way to make the collagen last longer or produce more? Sure. Um, is there any way to uh, make the collagen last longer? Um, some of it's hereditary, some of it's genetic. Uh, in terms of there are certain um, certain ethnic and racial characteristics that have some people have thicker skin than thinner than thinner skin overall. Um, in terms of diet, no, not really a healthy diet is what is what you need to have, and then that's why we're here talking about sunscreen. Uh, it's certainly true that um, that the more you the people that live in um, less tropical climates are less have better skin than people that are in the sun all the time, especially if you're Caucasian in in uh, in uh, in a tropical climate, you're in trouble in terms of, of these kind of problems. And one last question. What is the thickest skin? What part of the body has the thickest skin? Back. back. Yeah, the thickest uh, area, the skin that's the thickest is, uh, is on the back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, any other questions? Did, was that clear on, on how the skin works? Okay. So when we're talking about skin types, this is what we're talking about. There's actually a guy, a dermatologist named Fitzpatrick, who came up with these, these types of skin, skin types. And so a type 1 person always burns, never tans. A type 2 is always burn, rarely tans. That's me. Um, you know, type 3 gradually tans. Type 4 sometimes burns, but always tans. Some uh, Type 5 rarely burns, but tans well. And then African Americans will be type 6. So these are how you get into those into those, how you can categorize patients. Um, what does this mean for me clinically as a, as a plastic surgeon? It just has to do with um, how we look at when we're recommending different types of therapy, where we start and where we go from there. Well, that's true, um, and the question, the, the comment was made that African Americans do burn, and that's true. Um, and uh, it, it, I can, well, I don't have a picture of my partner, who's uh, actually from uh, Cameroon, and uh, he actually uh, underwent a peel, and he had very sensitive skin from that too. So it's not that, um, it's not that you can't burn, but the effects of that burning are much less than in the Caucasian. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all, um, it's almost always temporary. I mean, always temporary, really. So layering. This is kind of what I wanted to get into uh, a little bit about on the objectives. I think I mentioned layering. Layering um, is kind of like a cake, and that's more or less you're getting the concept of that from what I started out in with the drawing there. Um, so you have epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin. Then you have dermis, which is the collagen layer of the skin that gives it strength. Underneath that, you have fat. And underneath that, you have muscle. And underneath that, you have bone. So these, the way we think about um, skin care and sort of facial rejuvenation in it without surgery sort of thing is, is by looking at it in terms of layers. So bear with me. This is a little bit, uh, this may be a little bit on the cosmetic side, which may we'll talk about more about other things if you want to. But... Uh, this is just um, from the standpoint of if you come to the office for a cosmetic consultation about, you know, how do I make myself look younger. So uh, we work in particular with this group at Transforming Techniques, which is a medical spa down in Centerville. And um, these are some pictures of some of their patients who they've, they basically just do, these are estheticians that are boarded by the American Board of Com Cosmetology. This is nothing that I did actually. 
but they do a really nice job of skin care. And, and just by doing skin care, it's amazing what kind of results they can get sometimes. We're talking about um, what they use, the H, uh, layered a AHA peels, that's alpha hydroxy acid. They're allowed to do, um, and that's basically a, a fruit acid peel. And what they do is they brush little, a little dilute chemical on your face. And um, it get a little light burning, but typically no um, blistering or anything along those lines. It's just as they're designed to affect the epidermis, the top layer. Uh, but you can see that just affecting the epidermis sometimes has a pretty nice result. Um, amazing how you wouldn't think it would do much, but it certainly does. And so um, they do also things such as microdermabrasion, where it's a little sandblaster that goes over the face, which when they first came out, I was like, really? That's not, that shouldn't work. But, you know, they showed pretty nice results. And then a few years later, it comes out in our aesthetics journal that you can actually increase some collagen production just by working on the outside. So there, there is some outside in effect. Sure. When you do a peel, you're removing the epidermis? Correct. Not now, epidermis. not, well, it depends upon, uh, again, um, it depends upon the depth of the peel the concentration of the acid that you're using, and also it depends upon uh, the duration that it's on, and also the pH. So the question was, is uh, when you're doing a peel, um, are you removing the epidermis or the dermis, which are, what, what level are you doing? And the answer is, is that um, in these um, fruit acid peels that the estheticians are doing, you're talking about just epidermis and only really partial layers of the epidermis because they're by law only allowed to use up to a 30% fruit acid peel that has a pH of greater than three. So that's, they're, they're governed by the American Board of Cosmetology only to be able to use a certain strength. Now, um, since I'm, I direct them, we are able to use a little bit stronger stuff. They're, they're able to do that, and that's their benefit of the relationship with a plastic surgeon. What's the recovery time? For something like this, there's virtually no recovery time for the, what the estheticians do, okay? Uh, we'll go get into some other things for deeper stuff, but it depends upon the concentration of the peel. The question was about the recovery time for a peel. So the, um, the uh, peels that they, they were talking about what the esthetician is doing, uh, there really isn't any recovery time. Um, they have a little bit of a deeper peel that I actually have done a couple of times, and I'm 53, so it gives you an idea of my age. And uh, So it's one of those things where you, you don't see... Um, you, you really get, uh, uh, it's a little deeper peel, and, but I really didn't have any recovery time. I may not go out and run the next morning or something like that, but maybe one day or half a day, something like that. Does it get rid of those spots? Yep. Very, very much, can, it can improve those. Does it get rid of them completely? And does it, do they always stay away? Not always, because there is some, um, you, you know, if you go back out in the sun without sunscreen, you can restart the process, of course. Um, sure. Uh, the question is about age spots. So age spots basically are abnormal production of melanin, with it, which is in the skin. So uh, melanin is, if I may go to back to my board here, melanin is produced in this basement layer. So it's what gives you freckles. And it's produced right at this level of the epidermis here, okay? So um, what happens is the sun, when that hits it, certain p patients, and this can happen if, you're, if you have a burn injury or one of these peels, you want to make sure you wear sunscreen because any kind of injury to that area will, will increase the likelihood of these cells to be sensitive to the effects of the sun and produce more melanin. So the answer is, is that age spots, you know, we don't know it really, I can't really tell you why they develop in you know, like on this cheek and maybe not on the other cheek or those, that's all genetic invariability. But um, certainly things such as burn injuries, um, previous surgery, uh, those kind of things can all increase the likelihood of those kind of things developing, those kind of spots developing. So there's different um, forms called, uh, one form is melasma, uh, which is, you might have heard of that, but that's where mostly it occurs on the cheek and you get pig hyperpigmentation of that area, it's flat not raised or anything like that. And also, this is the area, these kind of things are where melanomas develop, which is a serious type of skin cancer. So these melanoma, these melanocytic cells right here, if they start to become abnormal in terms of their behavior and their biology, 
they can become skin cancer. And melanoma is a pretty common skin cancer, and it's a serious one. And the way we determine uh, the outcomes from melanoma are really how deep does it penetrate into the dermis. So we can grade melanomas on how deep they penetrate that way. And the outcome is directly related to how deep does it penetrate. And they actually have little micrometers that the pathologists get in there and they measure them under the microscope. And we get a different level of like maybe 0.5 millimeters or 4 millimeters or different things. Okay. Sure. You can't. There's this thing called a double helix that predisposes everybody to freckles if you're predisposed to them. It's what gives every, it's what makes everybody an individual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hereditary. Um, no, so there's hered there's hereditary things and genetic things. Okay. So genetic. All the questions that you have are genetics. Uh, but we have such a. If you look back. Think about all your ancestors, how many people have actually contributed to your gene pool. Um, you know, it's, it's out there. Now, hereditary things are like, there are certain types of skin cancers that are actually hereditary where they pass in an autosomal dominant genetic sort of pathway, but that's not freckles. Freckles are your genes. What has to happen for me to recommend a peel? Um, that's a good question. There are, maybe I'll, I think I'll save that one to the end. And uh, because it's a pretty broad question and that comes into patient selection and uh, those kind of things. So I think I'll save that one to the end here. Let's go through the rest of this. And then it's a good question and one that's very appropriate. And I'll, I promise you I'll answer it. So this has to do with basically a skin care regimen. Um, we kind of added this for completeness to, to give you an idea of what to, what to uh, use in terms of cleansers and, and these kind of uh, different products here. And then um, basically these are esthetician services too. If you're interested, uh, they do these kind of things every four to eight weeks as a maintenance thing. They have a, a definite routine that they that the estheticians use and I think it's definitely uh, something that we've seen huge differences in in fact I when it comes down to patients that I'll do facelifts on and those kind of things I actually highly highly recommend that they see the skincare people in addition because if they don't do this kind of stuff they really won't have the the best outcome and that's really what we're looking for facelifts do a nice job of kind of tightening and lifting and structural things, but doesn't affect, it's, it's sort of half the job, to be honest with you. And so it's not something where you can say, well, should I have this or should I have a facelift? It's, it all works together. So what's a peel? I guess we already talked about this a little bit, but the peel being application of chemicals to, to the skin to affect a controlled response and improvement in the skin itself. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about also filler. So people that have wrinkles and those kind of things, what are we doing to kind of help that out? And we can skip over this pretty quickly if you want to talk about other things, but essentially HA fillers are like the old collagen injections. You may have heard of, we used to use bovine collagen to do fillers of lines and those kind of things. And um, that's all kind of gone by the wayside because of the hyaluronic acid, which is a ground substance in our body. It comes like a gel and we use it to fill in folds, lines, and those kind of things, lip augmentation, those kind of things are what we use this for. And it comes with lidocaine, so it doesn't hurt as much as it used to. These are the two products. Just about everything nowadays that comes in cosmetic has two different products um, because one, there's two major companies that, um, Metasys and Allergan, that have these things, so there's, there's competition, so the prices don't go completely crazy. Botox and Dysport are the neuromodulators. Those are the ones that we use to uh, basically paralyze the muscle underneath the, underneath the skin. And what that does is relaxes everything so that you don't have these lines that are, as I mentioned before, are pulling on the skin. 
that's already brittle in the first place. And these are Botox and Discord are the two major um, major uh, suppliers of that. And these are all in-office injections. Resurfacing is probably the thing that we do as plastic surgeons do more than uh, peels nowadays um, because we can control the depth of the uh, with the laser uh, quite a bit easier than we can with a uh, deeper peel and the recovery time is a lot faster. I'll tell you why. Um, this dot therapy, and I'll show you a little video that my partner made uh, in a minute, but this dot laser is actually fr what we call fractionated. Fractionation means that um, it's, imagine you're, imagine you're uh, aerating your lawn. So you're punching holes into the lawn and you got little poke holes like that. But the grass kind of fills in over top of it pretty quickly once you get it aerated. The technology of the dot laser is such that when we hit the pulse, it gives us a square pattern, although we can adjust it in any, one, any manner. But it has little laser, pot, laser spots that punch holes into the, into the epidermis, down into the dermis like this. So if you look at the laser pulse, it goes like that microscopically. So it imparts this energy down into the dermis, but it leaves areas of the epidermis uninjured so that it can heal a lot faster. So we're talking instead of having with the old carbon dioxide lasers or the thick peels or the heavy duty peels that used to take three weeks and have a risk of depigmentation and scarring and those kind of things, we can um, use this to have a very similar result with a healing time of four days and no scarring and no depigmentation. So it's a big, very big advantage um, that we've used recently. You know, it says single treatment there. Um, we've had some pretty nice results with single treatment, but we've also done some where we've gone back another year later and touched them up a little bit. So I would say that's a little bit. I'll show you the video at the end. The last thing in terms of cosmetic stuff is basically just about volume fillers, which is a new kind of, this is a new uh, concept that we didn't really understand a few years ago. And what that is, is like you may have seen some of these women that are in California or something like that, that they get plastic put in their face and they look like a completely disfigured cat. And that's not the goal that we want to have here. We want to have a natural result. And so what we, um, what we found though is that's kind of interesting is that over time, just as, as we get osteoporosis, can get osteoporosis in our lung bones, we can get osteoporosis in the face too. So the cheek and the orbits and those kind of things, actually the bone actually undergoes conformational changes with age, which is part of the reason why, you know, you think, well, you started out with high cheekbones as a youthful person, and then all of a sudden they kind of, the face becomes more, flat, more flatter at the top and round at the bottom instead of the other way around. You look at that oval type thing. So what we do now, in addition to doing some facelifts, is we actually also have two options for doing, for adding volume back to the face that's in a natural way without using plastic or really uh, scary surgery. And that's using a product called Sculptra, which is a suspension. And the previous HA fillers that we talked to you about had only like one cc of volume that we'd put in at a time, maybe two. This we can put in 18 cc's at a time, so we can really fill up areas, uh, fill up folds a lot better, but it has to be put place deep. It doesn't do fine lines or wrinkles, just volume. And y even younger patients are seeing a benefit from that too. The other option is to use fat, and we do a fair amount of fat grafting too. Uh, somebody's <laughs> familiar. <laughs> but um, anyway, we have, um, uh, so what we do with the fat is, we actually have do liposuction to do to get the fat out, and then we um, and we have these different layers of fat in which this is fluid that we drain out, and we just use this layer of fat. Now this layer right here, you might be able to see, is um, is where we have uh, uh, stem cells actually, and that's part of the research that we're doing here is looking at fat and stem cells or new development. So um, anyway, that's that's another another option for adding volume. Uh, well, yeah, it becomes one of those things where uh, there's a little bit of judgment, but we start out with a standard amount that we put in, and if somebody has, you know, like in different areas, so let's say we're trying to fill in the temple area, 
or the cheek area, we start out with, okay, we're going to do three cc's here, three here, three here, and three down at the jaw. If somebody doesn't, clearly doesn't need as much in one area than another, then we adjust that maybe by a cc here or there. And we, the, sure, there are patients who we have have like puffy cheeks or something like that where we do liposuction on the cheeks too. So that's another possibility. Yep. It uh, generally stays put. The, the question is, is, does the fat migrate? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, the fat that we inject stays put. It tends to smooth out over time. It tends to. Sometimes it goes away. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so what we end up having is, um, what, what we end up having, and this is part of the science that we're ch still trying to figure out with fat injections. It's a very hot topic in plastic surgery right now. Because of the stem cells, there's issues of does it regenerate tissue? So if somebody has a radiation wound or something like that, will, will it actually, will the stem cells actually regenerate the tissue uh, and get rid of those kind of problems? Um, and it, it appears that stem cells are pretty are a pretty interesting topic in and of itself. I could talk for an hour on that alone. But our bodies are probably have a constant um, ability to undergo rejuvenation or regeneration more so than we ever thought before. And so um, it used to be that, well, you know, then, you know, skin dies or we have something or doesn't, there's no chance for it to regenerate. But actually, um, fat seems to be, uh, the bone marrow and the fat compartments both seem to be areas where stem cells are deposited in the body. So one of the things that, and we're, we've also found out that by uh, making some modifications to those stem cells from fat that we can turn that fat into bone for instance. So in the future we're hoping that we're able to instead of having a painful bone marrow t um, or a bone biopsy for a bone graft of an orthopedic injury we're going to be able to just suck a little bit of fat out which is a lot less painful procedure and turn it into bone and then put it in next to the bone to get it to heal. I'm sorry, into the folds? Well, say you want to talk about some holes. Sure. Does it dissipate quickly? How long does it take for it to dissipate and So you have an initial, uh, if you're using fat into the folds, you have an initial period where you have swelling from the procedure and stuff like that. So it looks, a lot of times it looks great right away, and then it tends to be, once that swelling goes down, then occasionally there's some disappointment with the results and stuff like that. But typically what happens is, is that about 80% of the patients have a really nice result and they have one time permanent result, okay? The, there is about 20% incidence of having to go back to do more fat grafting. And um, the more fat grafting occurs typically because our current knowledge and current science is that we're just sucking fat out and putting it back in. We don't know the life cycle of the cells that we're putting back in. In other words, all cells have about a seven year lifespan. So it could be that um, these cells are all kind of at the end of their life cycle that we're, that we're putting back in and they're ready to die anyway. And so they just kind of go away. It could be that they go away because they didn't get their blood supply reestablished, even though for the most part that's a technical issue that we usually don't run into, but it's still possible. So the, the answer to your question is, it's about an 80-20 thing. About one out of five patients, we end up coming back and doing something again. Yep. Did that answer the question? So in, in conclusion, sunscreens are crucial to health in this millennium. Skin care uh, programs are vital, and a multimodal approach with layering is important. Oh, here it is. So this is my partner, Dr. Uh, Mancho, who made this. Um, there's maybe not the greatest pre and post op pictures, but there's some other ones that we have. We've had some fairly dramatic results, and you can go to their website too if you're interested. It's listed on that thing. So I wanted to get back to a couple things uh, that are not cosmetic before we as before we close, because uh, I wanted to make sure that um, my I wanted to make sure that you guys understand my philosophy on on the aging skin and who's a candidate for appeal. And what options do you have? Because there are some people that, um, frankly, are um, weren't lived, didn't live in the era era of sunscreen. 
I mean, I was when I was a kid, getting a burn in the summertime was kind of normal, and I'm sure that some of you here were the same way. Um, so, I mean, my kids had never got touched, went outside without sunscreen, so that that's a whole different era, and we'll see how that plays out over the next several years, several decades. Um, but what's interesting, I remember when I first started practice back in 1995, I was in with a plastic surgeon who did a lot of dermatology. That was Mo, Dr. Collins was. Um, my senior partner uh, down in Centerville, and he did a lot of dermatology. In fact, it was so much dermatology that after seven years of surgical practice, I was very bored with it because it was, you, you trained to be a surgeon and then he's doing all dermatology. But I learned a lot from him. And what, um, what and a lot of times what uh, we would do would be precancerous lesions on the face. It would be, you know, we would excise them and they'd come in and we kept the practice busy by excising and closing lesions and stuff like that and all these other things. And, I, it never. It was never very satisfying to me because yes, it was an ongoing stream of patients, but it also was like an incomplete treatment. You know, um, because if you think about it, um, you know, if you get a lesion here on this cheek, that's not the only place that receives sun exposure during your lifetime. Your whole face did, your hands did, all these other things. So um, we've gotten. I've gotten kind of away from that kind of philosophy of just the the hunting and pecking and taking off little things here and there as we go. What we typically do when I see a patient coming in who's clearly got a lot of actinic damage, in other words, sun damage over the years, red spots everywhere, those kind of things, is we recommend a course of treatment, typically with a product called 5-fluorouracil or Effudex. You may have heard of it, you may not have, but it's a chemotherapy agent, actually, that's been diluted out into a formulation of a cream that gets applied to the face twice a day for three to six weeks. And you end up looking like the guy with the flash burn. I mean, it is a peel, literally a peel that is dramatic and it's uncomfortable. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a mild treatment at all. But what it typically does is it, it's essentially like getting peels um, that you would with a laser and those other, other things and it gets rid of a lot of that, um, that abnormal skin and it's treated the whole area rather than just little spots. And uh, we use it on the hands frequently, use it on the face. Um, you have to be careful not to use it on too big of an area at one time, so sometimes we'll treat just the whole face and then do the hands later. That's one of the factors. But the concept is, I learned this concept too in um, head and neck cancer. They call it a field cancerization concept, which means that the whole area, if, you've, if you think about somebody that's got a throat cancer, well, it probably came from drinking and smoking t cigarettes or whatever, and that whole area is going to be involved with abnormal cells. So it's not just the throat, but maybe the pharynx or the tonsil or anywhere along the head and neck, anywhere that it was exposed to that uh, carcinogen is likely to do, like the, likely to have a, have a skin cancer, which is what, or I have a uh, cancer to it. So the same thing concept occurs with the, with the face and the hands, anywhere that's been had a lot of sun exposure. So that's what we typically do with our elderly patients who come in with a lot of actinic damage is we try to restart the clock with an actual treatment with topical chemotherapy. Um, in terms of peels, who's a candidate? Um, basically everybody's a candidate. Um, if you look at it in terms of what type of peel are they a candidate for? So are they a candidate for just skin care in which they're getting just the top layer and epidermal turnover and cleansing of the skin and improvement in the skin. My daughter's 20 years old and she goes down for a little peel uh, when she goes down to, to the estheticians too. Um, and that ranges from people who are candidates for, uh, some plastic surgeons and dermatologists prefer using chemicals to lasers um, and there are pe peels that do the exact same thing that the laser does. Like I said, I don't use those partially because I think the fractionation concept and the healing time makes a lot of sense as opposed to bathing the whole face in a chemical that leads to a, a higher risk of complications. Uh, for skin care, so for acne, for oily skin, for those kind of things. So when I talk about a peel, again, you're talking about different levels of peel. You're talking about a very thin layer, superficial, that's just helping the epithelial cell turn over on the superficial layers of the epidermis. So if that was your acne treatment, I mean, what, how often does that have to be done? Well, we, I mean, typically it's about every four to eight weeks, something like that. Is there a cream for age 
Yeah, there's a cream for HBOTS called hydroquinone or soloquin forte. So um, it's basically designed to, it blocks the chemical inside melanocytes that convert the, the, uh, the chemical that gives you a brown pigmentation. It blocks that. It's a ty tyrosine is the chemical. So the question was, is there a cream for age spots? Do you need a yep, you need a prescription for it. Um, and there are also uh, different types of age spots, I will say. Uh, some of them are age spots that are more flat and just depigmentation, like melasma and those kind of things. Um, there are other age spots that are called subreic keratosis, which are kind of scaly, itchy lesions uh, that are on the skin. And those we typically don't really use uh, creams for that. We usually have to shave those off. But there's no cancer associated with those kind of lesions. So the question is, do you, who do you see for these kind of problems? And I think it really is a, um, an area of overlap. Um, and it's who you're comfortable with. And it's a matter of having a relationship with your doctor is the most important thing. So um, there are certain things, um, I guess the best way, plastic surgery is kind of an interesting specialty because we overlap with a lot of different specialties. I mean, and that's what I like about it, um, frankly, is I like doing hand surgery. I like doing things like this where we're doing dermatology. I like doing major reconstruction for my orthopedic colleagues where we're you know, um, doing major traumas and stuff like that. I like the variety. That's what attracted me to plastic surgery. Um, but um, dermatology, um, they are also kind of creeping into the surgical world too. So there are dermatologists that are fairly aggressive about doing Mohs micrographic surgery for excising skin cancers. I mean, in the past when I first started out, we probably did all of the surgery for skin lesions, and the dermatologist did just sort of biopsies and then referred them to plastic surgery for surgery. Now there's skin specialists that actually do their own, some of their own even flap reconstruction. So it's, there's a lot of different overlap between specialties. Right. The, answer, the question is, somebody could come to me, of course. Yeah. Um, we are. Right, typically that's what, what ends up happening. In areas of overlap, when they're clearly overlap where either dermatology or plastic surgery comes, then it comes down to a personal choice of the patient and the doctor uh, and your satisfaction with that practice. You know, is it something if you go to a place and you have to sit in my office for an hour waiting to get a skin mold checked because I was at an emergency surgery, you might not be too happy with that. But if you're in, you know, but, you know, on the other hand, if you're in the dermatologist's office and he had 47 people lined up, they might not be too happy with that either. So it depends upon how well the practice is run, and that's why we try to make sure that our practice runs as smoothly as possible. But our, there's also, you know, things that happen too. Yeah, it's effective. Um, the question is about freezing or cryotherapy. Um, and that's something that's pretty common. And that is one difference between what uh, dermatologists do and plastic surgeons. Most plastic surgeons don't do cryotherapy. I'd have to venture a guess to say it's something that uh, partly it's training. Uh, not, we didn't really train that much in it. And partly there are certain things that you have to have around to keep the cryotherapy away. And the other thing is, is that I just, uh, I think we're just more comfortable with at least from my viewpoint, cryotherapy is sort of like, oh yeah, just we'll dab that, we'll dab that. We don't know if that's skin cancer or not, we'll dab that. I, I'm more black and white when it comes to understanding what I'm dealing with, which is why I like to treat the whole area with Effudex or topical chemotherapy or those kind of things. And then anything that didn't go away with that, I want a biopsy. I want to make sure that that's not a skin cancer. That's my philosophy. That's not a dermatologist philosophy. They're okay with, you know, whatever. What causes pim the question is what causes pimples? Pimples are a collection of, um, so you have oil glands in the skin. And so whiteheads, blackheads, those kind of things. Blackheads are areas where usually it's an open area and you get a collection of wax or the sebum that is the oil that's in your normal oil that moisturizes your skin that gets caught 
in the follicle and doesn't express itself, doesn't come out. And so uh, whiteheads are ones in which the, the, the area is closed over top, so the oil keeps building up underneath the skin. And so that can eventually become a cyst. There are certain patients that have cystic type lesions on their face where the skin cells just keep building up until it becomes a mass, and those are things that we take out. So that can happen too. It doesn't happen that often in our practice. Uh, the question is, is um, if you go to see a, derm, a plastic surgeon and you go to see somebody that's cosmetic and then you, you find out it's not cosmetic and you end up going to a dermatologist and you're switching back and forth, is it covered by insurance and those kind of things? And the answer is, is that, um, well, first of all, if you come to the most, not all, but most cosmetic and this is one of the things if you decide to go to a cosmetic or a plastic surgeon or whoever you're seeing, you need to know up front what your cosmetic fee would be. Probably about half to two-thirds of plastic surgeons in this town don't charge a cosmetic fee for an initial consultation. So you don't lose anything by coming to see them, but you need to know that up front. Uh, and then the other question is, is if it becomes something that really is a medical issue that needs to be taken care of, most, most plastic surgeons, with the exception of, I think, only one person in town just does cosmetic. All the rest of us do both cosmetic and reconstructive stuff. So from that standpoint, there's only, only one guy, I think, that doesn't take insurance anymore. Every, all the rest of us do both. So you, it's not likely that you would get, go back and forth. I would say that um, there are a few situations where we do use dermatology from our standpoint. Um, and these are for clearly medical problems that are not, not in any way surgical or cosmetic, and those would be conditions like psoriasis or, or you know, other things like that where you have clearly a thing that needs, needs a dermatology consultation. How soon should you reapply sunscreen? Yeah, that's a good, how, should, how soon should you reapply sunscreen? That's a good question. Anytime you go in the water when you come back out, you should apply it, even though they, you may have water uh, proof sunscreen and those kind of things, it's still one of those things that I would recommend reapplying. And other than that, I, I would recommend reapplying every three hours. Yes? Tell me a little bit about moles and skin tags. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the question is about moles and skin tags. So moles and skin tags, skin tags typically are also known as papillomas, which are basically skin that has usually undergone some friction. So it's friction related. Usually you see most skin tags underneath the arms or around the neck where somebody has a necklace is a common place or their collar. Um, those are the two most common places for skin tags. You can get them anywhere, but those are the most common places. And so for those kind of things, uh, we just kind of take some scissors and snip those off in the office. Um, that's, that's what we do there. And typically that's a cosmetic thing. We try to keep the charges reasonable for that. Moles, sort of the same thing, only moles, uh, most moles are, and, and that's, this is kind of a good question because moles are sort of a judgment call. In other words, does it look suspicious enough to send to the pathologist or is it a cosmetic thing? And, um, and that's something that is an individual consultation type thing where we have to kind of say, yeah, if it's clearly a benign thing, it hasn't really changed, you've had it since you were 15 and you just didn't like the way it looks, that's the only thing that's bothering you about it, then yeah, that may be a cosmetic thing, in which case there's a cosmetic charge for a mole. Uh, but if it's something that's changing, bleeding, anything like that, then clearly it's a functional problem that needs, that's covered through insurance. Uh, the question is, is uh, about UVA and UVB, and uh, even though the SPF factor only measures the effectiveness against UVB, how do you know about UVA? The answer is, is that I don't believe there are any products left on the market now that only affect only block UVA. I mean UVB. 
So they all have effectiveness against UVA now. The question is, is with the rating, how do you know enough is enough? Um, that's a good question because I don't think anybody knows that right now. But we know there is there are sunscreens, and you can actually, if like avobenzone is one uh, that's a UVA um, uh, chemical. There's about there's about 15 of them though, and if you really want to know, you can look it up online. But most of the time, if you read the label, I was looking through this through all of our sunscreens, it says effective against UVA and UVB when you read the fine print. Yeah, uh, the question is about copper tone brands and those kind of things. Yes, they all, to my knowledge, they all have that. Sunglasses? Sure. Um, yeah, sunglasses are uh, important also. There's UVA. There's, there are certain glasses that are polarized that are, have UV protection also. Um, ocular melanoma is a whole other ball game. It's the question is whether or not that's related to the sun or a genetic issue. Um, so it's a good idea, but not proven scientifically, I don't think. Yeah, back. I had a friend that had plastic surgery, I think it was back in the day, and I mean, she had pictures where her face was all black and blue, and just, I mean, uh, laser, but it wasn't any of this side effects. So was that, she had to, uh, am I correct in saying that she had to spend way before laser? Yeah, uh, so the question is, is you, you had a friend that had plastic surgeon and they basically looked like hell afterwards. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, that's pretty common actually. And the, the thing is um, with that kind of thing is when you have, the, diff the question is, is, was it surgery? What kind of surgery? How extensive was the surgery? Were there complications? Were there not complications? So all these things when you talk about that and when you talk about you know, you talk to a friend that maybe had a facelift, or you talk to a friend that maybe had the laser treatment done, and they'll say it's the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. It's hard to judge that based on based on just uh, talking to somebody else because they may or may not have had a good result, or just because they had a great result doesn't mean you're going to get the same, and just because they had a bad result doesn't mean that you're going to get the same either. So it's one of those things where. Most likely in that situation, the way I would piece it together was she had a surgical procedure, and the pictures that she took were probably right after the surgery. Um, you're always going to look bad right after a major procedure like that. I mean, it's, your face is going to be, after a facelift, you get swollen, and usually in about two weeks, it goes away, with, or a week to two. Um, and these people, sometimes you'll see things on, on TV about these people, oh, I had this lunchtime lift and it looks great and all that other stuff. I mean, that's really trying to sell you something that probably is not exactly accurate. Um, and that's, a very, that's a very sketchy thing to do, in my opinion. Most of these kind of procedures take a couple of weeks to recover time, and you, and you got to look at that. And the other thing that you'd never want to do, whether it's the laser procedure here, facelift, or any, any kind of procedure that you have, is you never look at your result at day one, day two, day three, or day four. You look at it at day six months, and day one year, and day five years. That's when you look at, that's when you judge the results. Sure. Question is about facelifting and how deep do we go and what techniques there are and those kind of things. So, um, so facelifts are essentially repositioning the soft tissues of the face. And that includes skin, um, but not skin only. Uh, if you're doing skin only uh, lift, the problem is, is that um, what you end up with are scars that look bad. You end up with telltale signs of problems uh, in terms of earlobes being pulled down, wide scars things like that. Um, so the results are re usually very poor when somebody does a skin-only facelift. Um, and so the, the way what we do is we reposition the soft tissues. And I do a procedure called a max lift, which is where we basically take a suture loop and suspend the, we lift the skin away uh, through an incision in front of the ear. And then we take a loop that we tie down to next to the skull bone, actually. So it's a very significant anchoring point 
and then we make a loop that goes down into the cheek and then resuspends all that tissue underneath the skin and then we redrape the skin on top of that so that it's not under any tension to give you any pulling of the scars or anything like that. We do the same thing in the neck. Occasionally we do one in the upper cheek to kind of help the upper cheek if it needs it to. So there are a lot of different techniques. Um, as long as you're doing something to improve the deep structures, the results are pretty much the same. There was an interesting study that was done a few years ago where they took two twins, uh, two sets of twins. They had four very famous plastic surgeons that all had very radically different techniques, ranging from basically doing what's called a subperiosteal facelift, where one guy went down and just peeled everything off the bone and lifted it up to some guy who just did a little bit of this tucking of the soft tissue that I did in this, in a, mostly a skin resection and that, and, but did some of the, of the um, lifting of that deeper soft tissue, and they all had pretty much similar results. So you, everybody can brag on their own technique, but probably not big differences in, in, in. Really, the best treatment for sunburn is protecting the skin. That's moisturizing. So um, some people like aloe, some people, I usually just use moisturizer, like our favorite is Nivea or Eucerin. Yep. I, I remember uh, an ingredient starting with a P, P-A-V-O, something like that. Can you tell me anything about that? An ingredient called P-A-V-O. Well, I think there are a lot of different types of uh, different types of um, elements that go into products that sometimes don't, especially some of these products don't go through rigorous FDA clinical trials or anything like that because they're over the counter, and so they find out later that they were actually maybe sensitizers to this kind of sun. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming out. Hopefully, it was uh, educational.